I think he is intent upon doing it. Uh, you know, he's a Jesuit. And Jesuits always have a plan. And I think that, uh, you know, given his, uh, given his, uh, he, he's very resilient, believe it or not. And sometimes he looks kind of fragile, but uh, I hear that he's prepared, I forget how many rings, like 14 or 15 rings for new cardinals uh, that will be appointed or be named in the next uh, several months. Uh, with that, he is going to have a majority of folks in the uh, College of Cardinals who are going to be named by him. And this is going to change uh, the way in which that body is going to look at what's needed uh, in the election of his successor. Uh, I think that he is, he is open to, to dialogue and is not, af not afraid of having a little bit of chaos at times in terms of people discussing things. That's in fact, he wants to provoke discussion. Uh, he doesn't want to close it off. And so he, in, in a real sense, he, he's, he's, he's a leader who exemplifies an openness, someone who is comfortable in their own skin, who's able to, to move forward and, and despite opposition, and sometimes the opposition is, is rather uh, uh, kind of eccentric and unreasonable, uh, he kind of just kind of skims over that and goes to the, the, the central part of what, what's important. And so, uh, I, as, but as, as, a, as a Christian, as a Catholic, one of the great virtues that we have is hope. Hope is not the same thing as optimism, but hope basically means that, uh, that I think Francis in, is in that position for a particular reason right now, and that uh, he's helping to move the church to a place where it needs to go. Well, I think if, if there's a, I think the thing has kind of been forgotten in some places in the Philippines. And there's so, I think he would approve it if there was a groundswell in the Philippines to have it approved. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that'd be the issue. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in preparing this talk, of course, I go, you go on the web and there was, there was a photo of, of uh, there was an announcement that the Missa Banat Nabayan Filipino was approved. And it's a, it's a picture of uh, uh, someone sitting at, at, at a computer desk, actually a skeleton sitting on the computer desk, waiting for the approval. <laughs> and that was, that was, a, that was a kind of a humorous way of them saying, well, we're going to move ahead, even though it's not, a, it's not approved, you know, kind of thing. But no, I do think, though, that if the, uh, uh, when I was in Cebu three years ago for the uh, Eucharistic Congress, uh, this was a, a, a point that people were, were, were making that uh, they needed to go forward with this. Now, the thing is, now this is also true with the, the, um, uh, the, the Zaire rite of mass or the Congolese rite of mass. These things were done in a certain way, but they too need to be constantly adapted. You can't, you don't just reach a place where it's like, well, here's the right and it can't be changed. The right, like, for example, in Zaire that was approved in 1988, it was approved largely for a rural setting. But the Congo now, and especially Kinshasa and some of those areas, they become very urban. And the kinds of things that the right does, drawing upon rural kinds of symbolism, needs to be modified in order to fit the new uh, living situation of people as well. So what, when we talk about liturgy, we're always talking about a moving target and that would, it needs to respond and continually respond to the context in which it's celebrated. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, this is always the, always a, a very um, a tricky kind of thing that it's important, I think, for anyone who's, who's given the charge of, of celebrating to certainly respect the people in, in, the, in the assembly. And if they're going to make major changes in the liturgy, those kinds of changes need to be talked about and not just done from one night from one night to the following day that the, the the thing has to be talked about and there has to be a respect shown uh by the by the presiders uh toward the people in in the congregation uh 
the the problem constantly though is that especially here in, in well, here especially out out there in Australia <laughs> as it's here in the United States uh, when you have a multicultural group of people where do you hit in terms of, of making some of these changes and how do you do that and that that the only way to do that is to sit down and talk and to talk with people and to help them understand that uh, there there's a certain leeway here but that it's not it's not a blank uh, blank card either that that we that we make certain changes within a certain structure that we have but always it needs to be done with the dialogue and with respect for the people well you know i, I always thought and then of course you're going through this now too because you've had a recurrence of the covid business and people are in lockdown in melbourne and other places as well no yep. uh, the problem you know largely is that we've had we use very little imagination as church in our worship uh during this period uh the only thing we know, and I mentioned this last week when I taught the course, uh, you know, to the, to the folks, uh, that I quoted uh, Aidan Kavanaugh, who taught, he was a Benedictine who taught at Yale University for years and years and years. But he said, you know, after the council, unfortunately, the only arrow in our liturgical quiver seems to be the Eucharist. We are very unimaginative when it comes to doing anything else. But the Eucharist is particularly not uh, not appropriate, I don't think, or not not helpful when it's just televised. It's it's like televising a banquet. You don't <laughs> you don't participate in the banquet virtually. Uh, and if we had kind of sat down and thought about well, how, well let's pull on our own. Uh, let's it's based on our own. Uh, traditions, Catholic traditions. What about something liturgy of the hours? And there you could have women presiding. There, you know, that, that there could be all kinds of possibilities if we didn't s simply use the Eucharist as the only way in which we, we televise these things and try to bring people together. Uh, popular religious practice. Uh, many times in an Hispanic parish, for example, here in the States, it's the popular religious kinds of things that get everyone to come to church. The, the official liturgy, you know, the big, the big uh, example there is Good Friday. They'll have a, a, a reenacted way of the cross that would takes place through the, the, the barrio, through the, through the neighborhood. People in droves will come up uh, will come out for this. But then at three o'clock we have the, uh, the traditional uh, Way of the Cross, or a tr traditional uh, service of of Good Friday with the reading of the Passion and, and Communion, very few people show up. And so, in a certain sense, in those kinds of contexts, and I, you probably can think of other examples too. People vote with their feet as well, and. But that's popularism as opposed to the official. Now, am I in favor of doing away with the official? No. I think that, that, that that's also important as well, that there's a question of having both and here, that they can, they can inform one another. Uh, but, uh, you know, going forward, I think we've got to learn to be more creative in terms of how we incorporate various aspects of popular religion. And I'm, I'm most familiar with the Hispanic community, so I can, I can kind of speak to that. There's a, a practice that was developed uh, really in the first evangelization of the new world by Augustinians who came over uh, and it's called Posadas and it takes place in the first in, during the Christmas season and it's in preparation for, for Christmas and it's two you know, usually young people dressed up as Mary and Joseph and they go from house to house uh, pidiendo posada seeking refuge seeking refuge seeking shelter um, as Mary and Joseph did in, in Bethlehem and couldn't find any shelter. What, what this reenactment kind of does is to, to speak about the importance of hospitality and to speak about, uh, you know, how we as a Christian community uh, deal with questions of homelessness even. And also, you know, in the United States, our, 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 our terrible uh, immigration system that has not been very helpful for people. Uh, but what, what these popular religious customs do is to pick up some of those themes. And uh, in some parishes, 
on uh, Christmas Eve, the Christmas Eve mass will be preceded by a posada and Mary and Joseph will come to the church, knock on the doors of the church and be received in the church. And that's the way that uh, the Christmas uh, mass uh, begins for the Hispanic community in, in many parishes. So just an example of how popular religion can kind of be incorporated. Yeah, well, no, I mean, you obviously there is superstitious elements to sometimes to popular religion. They have to you take those in consideration. Part of the thing is, you know, and I wrote a book several years ago with a, a Mexican colleague named Arturo Perez. And we, we basically spoke about the need for uh, we who are, are trained officially as, as ministers of the gospel uh, to learn how to learn from the common people and to sit down with them and listen to what they really believe. Because sometimes when we can, we, can, we can judge practices from afar and think this, they're, just, um, they're just superstitious. But that might not be how they're being perceived by the people who are, are, are doing them. They, they could, however. The Pope talks about, you know, distinguishing the tares from the wheat. And we have to do that at times as well. But, but part of it is, again, to sit down and talk to people in terms of, what do you believe by doing this? What is, what is, the, what is the sense? And, and, and sometimes these particular conversations are wonderful ways to evangelize. And because we're talking about practices that they've done for so long, and sometimes they haven't thought about them that much, or they have thought about them. So these, these practices represent real values for us that we want to maintain in our culture and our religious, uh, in our religious uh, expressions. All right. Well, I think a lot of it also has to do with, uh, you know, what is the makeup of the, again, what is the makeup of the assembly? Uh, it's one thing to, uh, I know you have that, uh, that Sunday for uh, Aboriginal Sunday and Torres Island or Sunday, this kind of thing. But it's very important not to simply incorporate symbols and signs of someone else's culture that you're not quite sure what they totally mean. I think there you've got some some good liturgical aids out there that that help to avoid that, but the, uh, the anthropologists call <laughs> call this the the, pra the practice sometimes of uh, uh, bricolage and braconage, two French words. Bricolage means kind of gerrymandering things together that don't necessarily go together. Braconage is poaching, and poaching on someone else's religious symbols that. Uh, that really indicate one does not fully respect or appreciate what those symbols are, especially if they're not your own. And especially if there are no one, there's no one there from that culture to celebrate them. You know, I don't know if you can be too pastoral. Uh, you know, I, I suppose that, uh, you know, what the, one of the key kind of uh, values that Francis speaks of always is, is the, the, the question of mercy and the mercy of the church. And we, the church has so long, especially in some of the, pres the previous pontificates, emphasized what we are against and what you can't do as Catholics and kind of wagging fingers at people and all this kind of thing, rather than to emphasize what the church is for. You know, for the liberation of humanity, for uh, the bringing out the best in people, for 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 trying to to build up communities of love and compassion, and uh, overcoming the indifference that our modern culture often uh, expresses toward people who are suffering. And so, when you talk about you know he he's too pastoral, uh, I suppose God is too pastoral because God is ever merciful. And it, how can we be less merciful than God? At least we shouldn't be, I don't think. Uh, okay, well, and we're, that's, that's a key uh, kind of a question these days. Uh, the Pope, of course, gets, I suppose the Pope there has become too pastoral too. Uh, 
when he spoke about uh, in, in a church in Rome, he visited the Lutheran church in Rome. And then someone raised the issue of mixed marriages and a Catholic and a Lutheran living together. Could, could it not be possible for the Lutheran party and going to mass with the Catholic party to receive the Eucharist? And the indication, he didn't say it point blank, but the indication was he wouldn't be opposed to that. Uh, if we, I think we need to take another look in terms of how we understand uh, the Eucharist as the sacrament of unity that it is. Uh, is it is it something that uh, at least is is the, the the sacrament of the Eucharist the the only kind of a hedge that we have or a statement that we have that that ex, that divides us between. Uh, ourselves and, and other Christians, and that's that's uh, that's a question that we all have to ask and and discern together. Uh, I have been in ecumenical situations, and it's painful when we can't share the Eucharist. And you know, I, I've gone up, and you know, you know, kind of you cross your your hands, and, and you get a blessing, and then the Protestant uh, folks do the same thing, uh, but. It, in, in a certain sense, when, when we're so close, and especially if we're involved in works of mercy together and, and reaching out to, to, to people uh, in, in various ways to our society, and then all of a sudden at, at, the, at the Lord's table, we're, we're divided. Uh, I, just, I, know, I know of a strange situation where there's a chapel that's used by both Anglicans and Catholics and there's there's a there's a two room tabernacle. On one side is the Anglican Eucharist, the other side the Catholic Eucharist, and so. But at least they receive it for the same tabernacle. Not great liturgical practice either, but that's. Yeah. Well. Uh, the, 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 in terms of a, a formal kind of a thing is to, to write the bishops and have them pressure uh, the congregation for worship to have the other translation approved uh, in order for that to happen. Uh, I have to say, and I, and I will confess my sin publicly, that there are certain things that I will not say that are in the new translation. Uh, I will not say, because it, doesn't, it makes absolutely no sense. I will not say, for example, chalice. Jesus did not take a chalice at the Last Supper. <laughs> he took what in the, in the Greek word is a poterion. He took a cup. Uh, and if any of you, and this is, this is proved by uh, that Indiana Jones movie, the, the Last Crusade, right? And I ever see that movie. <laughs> it's, a, it's a simple cup that he took. Uh, but he didn't take this chalice. Uh, and the other thing, you know, in, in our translation, for example, of the uh, uh, words of institution, that this is my blood, which will be poured out for you and for many is the current translation. Uh, and that's, that's correct in terms of how it is in Latin, which is based on uh, one of the suffering servants uh, lines in, in Isaiah 53. But the problem is that when we say for many, we say, well, for many, but there are some people that he didn't shed his blood for in English. It doesn't mean that in, in Hebrew, but it does mean that in English. The Italians, this is under the pontificate of Benedict XVI, the Italians opposed the change of this and wanted to maintain the blood that was shed for all, for everyone. And finally, after the, like the 10th or 12th bishop came to the Pope and said, we need to continue saying for all and not just for many, the Pope threw up his hands, okay, do what you want in Italian. So they, they say that in Italian. Well, if they say in Italian, I think probably we're not going to go down too much of a, a slippery slope by saying all in English either. Simply because it's it's better theology, and it's 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 a it's a it's a, it's a statement that people understand that that Christ died for everyone, not just for certain people. So anyway, in terms of, of making this all formally 
different, uh, formally approved, I think, you know, to, to do that, it has to go through the, through the bishops' conferences, and the bishops need to write a letter and, and, and ask for the approval of the 1988 translation. 